Um, well, it's a complete honor to be here, uh, and I absolutely feel like I'm amongst friends and family. Uh, now that I do know also that you are my family going forward, as, as, uh, as I'm never going to leave, which is, which is great. Um, I, can sign up, I can sign up to that. It's deeply embarrassing to have this behind me. I'm going to go forward. There we go. Um, so no. so um, what I wanted to do is you wanted me to talk about the future of work, which is something I've been kind of you know, very excited about to the point of almost being obsessed by um, for a long time. But in the spirit of, of Herb's narrative, I thought I'd tell you about why, you know, why I came to be interested in it, why I think it's so important for all of us here in this room, um, and what it means for all of us in this room about leadership. Because I think it poses an opportunity for all of us to step up and be leaders because of where we are right now with the future of work. Um, so as you mentioned, I grew up in a lumber town um, so this is sort of pre-2000. Um, I originally came here in 1986, which was fantastic. My grandmother was from, from the UK. I then became a computer programmer. Um, my first degree was in political science. Then I did econometrics here, because I really like numbers, as you will about to be horrified by the amount of numbers that you're about to see. Don't try to memorize every slide. It will not work. Um, and, um, then um, I studied business at Harvard, which was very helpful because it was there that I also studied and learned the narrative of lots of entrepreneurs and really understood what innovation was. And 850 case studies after, afterwards, I came out thinking, I'm one of those. I understand what one of those are. And that's, that's, that feels right. I can feel comfortable navigating whatever, you know, whatever that is. Um, I then joined my first startup in 1994, um, founded the second startup, and it sort of all rolled on from, from there. Um, and then, so this is what's called the entrepreneurship age. Um, and then it got a little bit messy after I floated the second, after I floated the second startup, which was the most oversubscribed um, startup on the London and NASDAQ markets at the time. Um, but 2000, you know, markets go up and down. Now, I don't know if anybody here can remember what happened in 2000, but um, it was really good right up until uh, I floated. And then shortly afterwards, it became quite interesting. Um, and I learned also so other lessons. Um, but entrepreneurship has remained a central theme and innovation has remained a very much th central theme. Um, but in all of the things, how many, I don't know how many entries you said were in the thing, probably too many, um, they sort of go around policy and thinking what is it that the government can do to influence our world. And I've had a couple of things that I did around there, which was um, you know, working sometimes with city mayors, sometimes um, with Nesta, sometimes innovation in the cabinet office, always around innovation, trying to think, what is it that gets, what is it that stimulates economic growth, and how much a role does government have in it as a member of our ecosystem? And um, I also did, as you say, work in finance as an angel investor. Um, I can't quite stop myself. I see something really exciting, and I want to help the entrepreneur. Um, and in helping them, you also learn about future of work and a few other things, um, which as you, you'll see shortly um, affected the, the, the lecture that I'm about to give. Um, I've had some bouts in venture capital, more mainly giving them money um, and then watching them, you know, sort of spend it. Um, <laughs> um, I've learned quite a lot about culture by joining in educational companies mainly, focused on trying to make it really easy from the age of six to understand how innovation works um, and the hope that you should feel about the impact that you will have on the world because the world is made up of people that you that don't accept the status quo and they make it. And I didn't understand that when I was a small child growing up in Prince George. Um, board of DCMS, which is the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport, um, and actually a board in the National Gallery, which is, I have no I idea why I'm there, but it's a digital board, so I understand digital stuff. Um, but again, that gives you just a view of all of the things that are changing at the same time and the pace that, it that is um, expanding. Um, the Scale Up Institute, and I've worked with a number of people in this, in this room with the Scale Up Institute, which is focused on growing companies and stimulating the economic growth of communities. And um, I'm going to start on that, and I'm also going to finish on that, because um, Sharon, you've given me permission to uh, t toss down a gauntlet and a provocation. So um, there is a provocation around that, and a, an absolute role, I think, for the business school. Um, human capital. Um, I love universities. I absolutely love them. Um, I love how they form people. I, help, I love how they help them see the future. Um, I particularly love how they work as a business, because universities and business schools are businesses. You have to hire people. You have to um, incentivize them. 
you have to measure whether their work um, works. Um, and that's where I understood, again, academic publishing. You, you know, when I was at CUP, all of the academics have to publish stuff, and then you have to see if people read it. And then my time with Cambridge Assessment was, well, if they read it, does it impact them? Does it work? Because in my world of startups, you have to tell if your intervention works. And really understanding how that works and the real role that a university can have um, has been really exciting for me in this mess of a career or a non-career or a whatever it is you want to call it. Um, and I actually think that the careers that we have and that the students who are currently at university will probably look more like this than a straightforward, I start at a large company and I stay there for 20 or 30 years and then I leave large company. Um, what I know from the time that I was at LinkedIn that is on average every single person has 25 different jobs between the time of graduating and retiring. That's quite a few jobs. Um, and seven different identifiable career streams. Well, if that's what the future of work looks like, or that's what the future of work is now, what's it going to look like in a few years' time? Uh, and I loved having been asked to do this because it made me think a little bit, or quite a lot more deeply about the, the subject. Um, and then on markets, um, I do, I love double-sided marketplaces. I love liquidity in markets. Um, it doesn't matter what industry. Um, bringing people together so they can do stuff that they want to do faster, better, cheaper is really interesting for me. And it's also how the capitalist system works. Um, so that's a bit. So that was, that was sort of the last 20 years. This, is, this lecture is pulling stuff from all of these different companies that I'm currently doing things with at the moment. Um, and hopefully there will be a narrative through it and it will come out okay in the end. Um, and it's gonna go, it's gonna start to go a little bit faster now. Um, and there's gonna be way too much data, but I'm just trying to tell a story. Um, so all of those things over the last 20, 30 years, all of this innovation, which is a lot of innovation, has really helped me understand how fast innovation is now happening. And if you look at here, we see from, you know, how long does it take to gain 50 million users? Well, quite a long time ago, when they introduced airlines, 68 years before you had that many users. And you think, well, what about ATM? 18 years before there were 50 <coughs> million users. And then you think, well, computer, well, it's about 14 years. The world is getting faster. Industries are changing and reconfiguring faster and faster and faster. Facebook, three years. Twitter, three years. Pokemon Go, 19 days. That's a gaming industry. Um, these are industries, people buy and sell stuff, and jobs in these industries are coming and going with great rapidity, which means there's a call on all of us to be very agile and to be more agile and to make sure that people, while they're at university, um, learn about agility um, rather than necessarily a specific set of goals. Um, the reason why it's taking less time um, for these to get huge numbers of users because technology makes it easier. It's two things. One is business productivity. And again, when you see things moving quite slowly, when you get into the social media stack, um, it goes a lot faster. And that's because it's a lot more productive. Uber, which has um, got some issues as a company, um, but they make it super simple to get a taxi. And if you're driving a taxi, they make it super simple to get someone to drive somewhere. And that increases the business productivity and frees them up to do many things. And when that happens, you get these increases. And from a consumer, the same sort of thing. Industry after industry after industry, it's really very interesting how this is progressing. Um, but that gives us some other issues, which we can see here. Um, as you stop being a taxi driver or stop being a taxi controller, other things have to do. And there will be tens and tens, hundreds of millions of jobs that are phased out. Um, at the same time, there will be tens of millions of new jobs that are phased in. Um, some of them very, very interesting. Um, but some of them not very interesting. So what does that mean for us as a parent? What does that mean for us as a government? What does that mean for us as a vice chancellor? What does that mean for us as a professor? Um, it means we have more opportunities to lead, I think. Um, I like automation. Sometimes I like automation, except when you see movies like Wish You Were Here. And I don't know who here saw Wish You Were Here, but it's a fundamental movie about what happens when things are automated. And when they are, um, it also means that it's harder for young people to get their first foothold into the working world. It used to be quite straightforward. You know, we'd ask, what are you going to do when you grow up? Well, I think you should do this. What's the answer now? 
um, quite difficult because automation is doing quite a few things. This talks here about what happens with the concentration of the top 10 jobs that are being displaced at the moment. And, you know, well, if you're a parent or a teacher, you really shouldn't advise people to go into the displaced industries. Um, but these are quite popular and they employ large parts of our population. So what are we going to do about that? Um, something that's quite disturbing is that workers with high school diplomas are only, are far more likely to be in automatable roles than otherwise. So what does that say? That could mean, if we don't do anything about it, that there's an increase in the disparity between haves and haves not, rich and poor. And that's not something that anybody wants in our society. So we need to work to um, make sure that that doesn't happen. I think this is interesting. I told you I liked numbers. Um, this is talking about those areas where they're shrinking, and this is between 2016 and 2030, just pulling together at a macro level what is going on. And you can see physical manual, again, decreasing quite a lot. Huge increases in technological skills. And this is a theme that, the theme that we'll keep on going. But how fast do we, as parents, as universities, expand the people who can teach technological skills? How can you do that? Um, and do you have to do it very fast anyway? Well, this shows at a very high level uh, and on a global basis what's going on. I'm going to show you some other things in the UK to show um, isolated where it's happening. Um, if we look the decade ahead, STEM skills are very much in um, order. You can see these are increases in employment growth between 20, sorry, when is it? 2017 to 30, and the focus from now to 20 years forward. So it's good if you like health. Great, we were just up in your Helix thing, even better. Health and data science, fantastic. Um, but um, on the other hand, you can look in other areas, which used to be quite popular, um, but they're not growing. But they used to be the first jobs that people would have. And they used to be a common thing to say, oh, well, you should think about this. Um, I'm really interested to know that 100% of the net new jobs in our economy, and this is across the OECD and also correct in the United States, come from companies that are less than five years old. So at the business school, do you feature companies that are more than five years old when you give lectures and ask them to give lectures? How does that feel? <laughs> Sorry, I cold call you now. Um, but, but it makes you think. Um, it's very interesting also in the UK that the high growth business sector creates 4,500 jobs, new jobs every week, which is actually more than the FTSE 100. Um, we always hear about FTSE 100. The media like to write about them. We don't hear very much about the fast growth companies um, because they're harder to find. But they actually do drive the economic growth of our, of our economy. If you talk to these fast growth companies who are created for, again, 100% of the jobs, 82% say they'd be able to grow their company faster um, if university graduates had the skills to, meet, to help them meet their customer demand. And that's interesting. So the only thing that's holding them back is not that they're not ambitious. It's, they just, it's not that they can't get finance. It's that they can't get people who have the skills that they need to do, um, which is interesting. Um, if you look at the number of open positions, if you just survey the high, high growth companies and you add up, and this is from Adzuna, you add up the number of classified ads that they have right now for open positions, it's about 990,000 open positions, and those open positions are increasing. So if they could hire the skills, they would make that many jobs overnight, and they'd be able to serve all those extra customers the next day. And that's an opportunity for us to lead. I love this one, particularly after I had the very short um, visit of the, the Helix. Um, so this is some work that we did at the Royal Society earlier this year. Um, we looked at the trends in the increase in demand for certain skill sets. And what we found is that in just the past three years, there's been an 8,369% increase in skills for data scientists, advanced analysts who work on Apache Kafka. Now, there's actually quite a lot of people that do that, but that may sound crazy. So, but how do you, at a university, and I'm glad that you're doing what you're doing, especially around data science, but how do we, 
That's not a 20% increase. It's not a 100% increase. This is a massive increase. And we have to be very agile and help people learn what they need to do in order to do it. And what we have to do at universities is help create a lot more of those a lot faster. Um, there is an issue. I'm now going to um, turn a little bit to at the university, sort of how, how, what we need to do about it. But that there is an issue in that at universities all around, sorry, not, perhaps not at Newcastle, but <laughs> other universities are having an issue, um, an issue with this responsibility. Um, and again, um, the, the learners still have a lot of faith in them, but there's a lot of things changing. There's these gig jobs, there's unconventional career paths. I would have an unconventional career path according to most people. Um, and there's tech disruption. This looks at what the new languages are. So they're entirely new languages, and this comes from a Pearson, Pearson study looking about you know, coding along with English, help them you know, compete better. And what you see here is coding is just coming up to the New English behind Chinese. So how are we all teaching people coding? And at what age? Estonia starts teaching coding at age six. When do we start? Oh, and it's obligatory. You can't opt out of it, as opposed to we were talking earlier at lunch about maths being capable of being opted out at 16 here in this country. So what are we doing about that? We're looking at European countries resolving this, some of them in the US, by hiring, because they don't have as bad a skills crisis as we have, um, but mainly by hiring and retaining and also by retraining. There's some really scary issues around retraining um, or retaining employees at the moment. The average millennial person who's between 20 and 30 um, stays 10 months on average in a job now in a company, um, which gives other economic issues for the companies that employ them, um, which need to, be, need to be addressed. It gives companies less desire to train them. Um, and they find they have problems retrain, retaining them because they think, oh, I'm, I'm not happy here. I'm going to go here and here and here. But on average, the average right now is 10 months in position, which gives another opportunity for universities to rise to. Subject majors. How important is a subject major? Well, you can see that people are starting to think that it's less important. Um, so we are here in the UK, and at the moment, only 36 chose a career Related to, the, related to a subject that they studied in. So I know that we often angst as parents about, oh, which subject is the most important? But it's actually of declining importance. And that's something that we, and you can see right across, right across the, the world. And this is the largest study that was done of, of learners in probably the last 15, 20 years. Um, and it came up a couple, couple months ago. So you look at um, what the career divide is and Europe. Don't think that many of them don't think that higher education prepared them for their, for their life. Um, and again, it's not, it's not pretty reading. Now, as an entrepreneur, I love when I see industries like this as an entrepreneur. It, I feel like a cat with my tail switching back and forth. It's like, boy, is there an opportunity there. Um, that is something that we can fix. Um, but if I were thinking as an advisor to universities, this is, you're the incumbent. There's an opportunity, and it's yours. It's yours to have. Um, I think the belief that education systems failing the current generation, again, goes on and on and on, and it's not just in this, in this country. Lots of people are saying that hiring somebody you know, who's a B student, but with a relevant internship, is way better than having a straight A student. And that's kind of interesting. I think it absolutely means for us as educators, part of a university degree, um, be it an undergraduate or a master's or a PhD, really needs to feature, feature that. Particularly as there are no longer, as we saw earlier, jobs, opening jobs, fully permanent jobs for people any longer. So the need to have several internships, several experiences of work baked into probably your secondary school and your college and university is more acute than ever before. Um, looking beyond their university to degrees, um, again, can you do okay in life without a degree? Again, marked differences 
over time in what, what we're seeing here. Um, used to be okay and easy, but it's not any longer. Vocational degrees um, are now seen as strong alternatives, but there are weaknesses in those as well, um, which again is just a great opportunity for us. So if we look at, again, going back to the whys, the whys is the um, um, women's science and engineering, um, internships versus grades, job-related no knowledge is now more important than a degree. Now, I don't believe that, um, but it's interesting that so many people do believe that. And therefore, isn't it better to get both at the same time, hand in hand in hand? I like the idea of the traditional classroom being flipped upside down. Um, and I think it's, it's quite helpful. So in a model where people are participating in education over their lifetime, we keep, need to keep on retraining. Um, we have stackable credentials, and they move in and out. This is really important. Um, I talked about the, the tech gap. I talked about the 8,000% increase in Apache skills. Well, what about somebody who can actually talk about what is an Apache skill um, and explain to somebody else what it means? But the skills on AI are pretty important. They're, rare, they're not going to thinking skills, navigating skills. Those aren't going away at all. Um, so those are the skills that we need people to come out of university with as we go forward. We do know that it's going to become more important, and I think most everybody agrees is looking in the U U.S. Workers will need to improve uniquely human skills like creative thinking, reasoning, and collaboration, storytelling, um, going back to Herb's, Herb's talk. Um, and then workers will need to keep up with STEM, also the case, but it's not an either or, it's a both. On their own terms, what does it mean to upskill? Do we do a two-year MBA, or do we offer top-up courses for people in your community so that they can do the things that they need to do as they figure out what their skill gaps are, as they fill the gap as their industry that they're in reconfigures? Um, the front-end loading that I think has been a traditional method used is, is going to change. Um, again, soft skills, what are called soft skills, or touchy-feely subjects. When I was in business school, I called them touchy-feely subjects. Um, they're really important, um, and they're really hard. Um, they're actually quite hard to teach. Um, in a classroom, they're quite hard to teach. But putting three people through jobs and internships and roles and projects, that's how you learn them. And that's how you pull out from an, and you augment something from an academic subject. It pains me to think that 31% of people starting out um, don't feel they have the appropriate skills, because that's just wrong. I think when you bounce out of university, you should bounce out and you can think, wow, don't stop me. I'm so excited. I'm so filled with hope. There's so many opportunities to make my mark on the world. Um, but they cite, they cite this. Um, but this is a solvable problem. Um, leading the reskilling and upskilling. And I think you have to turn to employers to do this. And they absolutely see themselves as a part of the solution. So what kind of training did you undertake? How are you going to do it? Um, you know, did you do it on the internet? Do we trust degrees that you can get on the internet? Can you get a degree on the internet? Is it worth having? Do people learn that way or do they not learn? Um, so again, there's lots of questions about how people learn and where they turn to for these credentials. Um, and there is a real importance for a university to, who does study the impact of learning and who cares about whether or not somebody has learned when they go through the program that's really, really important. And I wouldn't want the world to be taken over by um, random things on Google to be what education is because the assessment of whether or not learning has occurred and whether or not it helps a young person is really important and it's also really hard um, and that's where we need to come together. Um, but stackable or micro-credentials um, and on-demand learning and how we um, make sure that this is something that is open to universities and business schools is really important. And I'm going to ask you some questions at the end. Look out. Um, and this goes again, front end learning. Do we think of, again, when I was, it's like, well, you do your undergraduate and then you're done. It's like, and what I loved most about becoming an entrepreneur 
was that, uh, so I went to consulting first, then I became an entrepreneur. I felt like I learned more every single week than I might have learned the whole year before. Because when you're trying to meet your customer demands and you don't know all the answers, you teach yourself stuff. You read every book there is, you talk to everybody who you, know, you can find, um, and you find what the answer is, and you continue to learn. And I definitely didn't understand how much lifelong learning was for all of us, um, and about how that was part of our life. But it's gonna be even more part of our life going forward. Um, so it's a good thing that businesses are willing to play their role, um, and that they are. Sometimes we don't listen to businesses, and we make it really hard for them to do certain things. I think we were talking earlier about um, getting some of your undergraduates out into schools, and it's like, well, you couldn't possibly do that because they need to get a police check to make sure that they're not going to go do terrible things to the children. Um, but again, there's been lots of innovations that show that these checks that have been put in place for good reasons are not necessary if they're in an open room like this rather than a single room. So some of the, again, health and safety checks, DBS checks, are often held up. But what we found throughout the UK and throughout the world is that there are safe ways of allowing business people to augment what teachers are doing in the classroom, be it university or school, um, which, doesn't, which you can rip away the barriers for. And that's quite good that 65% are willing. I wish it was 100%. It um, should be 100%, but 65 is okay. Um, going on the what entrepreneurs do when they get frustrated, um, I found myself after some of those other things being an entrepreneur again, or entrepreneur and philanthropist. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about what caused me to want to do founders. So I've got three case studies coming up here and then I have my provocation to um, what I'm hoping um, you guys are going to do after getting this call to action. Um, so on Founders for Schools, um, we started this up by getting people who had run businesses into schools. And we wanted to make it super simple to be able to do that. And one of the reasons why I was interested in, and where's David? David is over there, David Claston. Um, so um, for the past three years, um, I've been watching this community here in Newcastle um, stream into classrooms much faster than any other community in the UK. Um, and we started up about three years ago. You invited us into your boiler room with a bunch of teachers. Um, and you had us tell them about this platform that would allow them to get business leaders to talk about what they were doing in their offices um, in the classroom. And we didn't really know if it was going to work or, if it, you know, we just thought, well, we kind of knew it was going to work, actually, to be perfectly frank. But it was working in London at that point, and it wasn't yet working up here. And so we got some people together, we told them about it, and then over the last three years what we've seen is that Newcastle has raced above every other city in the UK, and in Founders for Schools it's our top reporter. So half of, every, so half of the entire school age population of children have met entrepreneurs in their classrooms in Newcastle in the past year um, because teachers are asking and business volunteers are saying yes. And I'm quite excited about that, I think that's very good, I can't quite... Um, I wouldn't have guessed that it would be here, um, but as I read the books that, uh, you know, I learn more about this community, it's an actual real community. And platforms help communities solve problems that they care about. Um, so one of the things that we do to educators is our platform teaches educators about the future of work. It helps them find startups. It helps them find scale-ups. Um, it will also help them find the big professional services companies. Um, that they can go into it. Um, but it will also guide them to what they should do next. They might start with a career fair, which is actually not that helpful for a child, um, but it will suggest the next thing to them which will be helpful, which will probably be mock interview or speed, speed interviewing or something like that. Um, and I love the fact that we in technology, we who are entrepreneurs, can create technologies that solve problems we care about um, when nobody else seems to be solving them. That's why I love being an entrepreneur and being an innovator, and it's probably why your father liked being an innovator. Again, if something was wrong, well, let's just go fix it. Um, so one of the things that we've done, because teachers don't get retrained as quickly by the DFE, or they do get trained in technology, but they get trained on, well, technology will allow people to prey upon your pupils. They are going to bully them, and they're going to stalk them. 
And that's what technology does. Well, actually, technology can help teachers unravel the future of work for young people. And if you train them not to be frightened of digital tools, it can be their best friend, which is what we've seen happen in the, over the last three years in Newcastle. Again, 500, is, 500 per thousand is your um, rate of student employer encounters per child. London's 250, <laughs> which is fantastic. Um, so anyway, that's quite exciting. So the other thing is um, creating online courses and being certain about which of those encounter types that they're trying out in classes, which methods of teaching that they're trying are actually having the impact, and then we build that in. And if they're a new teacher, quite high turnover in the teaching profession, so we help them know, well, if you're teaching 17 to 18 year olds, this is what you should do next. And if you're teaching 11 to 14 year olds, this is what you should do next. Um, and we've just started a new program called Maths for Girls to stop, well, to stop girls from not choosing maths um, because we were really grumpy um, about girls op being able to opt out of maths classes because they couldn't go into our really exciting com companies um, or actually into the, you know, again, some, if they want to go into the helix, they're going to have to have maths, aren't they? But they may not know and they may be getting poor guidance at 11 to 14 otherwise. So we've um, gathered together what everybody was doing, which is exciting. The other thing is that um, in Britain, People don't talk about themselves. It's communities that celebrate what people do. Um, and that's a good thing. I actually think people drawing attention to themselves is not great. But it means the need for communities and universities to draw attention to scale-ups or startups is super important. And what we've done is, for Newcastle, if the person has spoken in a classroom, just like you're putting those giant posters <laughs> up your stairs, um, we put well, tiny pixelated you know, things on, 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 our, on our website that shows journalists and mayors and vice chancellors and teachers who are the businesses that are A, growing, B, that are kindly putting themselves out into the classroom. And I think this thanking and using technology as a way of helping this at scale is an interesting thing for, um, for doing. And so that's some of the stuff that we've been doing at Founders for Schools. Um, also as an entrepreneur, I'm gonna turn on to, hopefully, um, work experience. Um, before I talk about other stuff, computers. So what do we think about here? Well, I went too fast, didn't I? Sorry, why am I going that way? So on work, find, going on the work experience, when, you f when I found out about that, we thought, well, let's make it lots easier. So we created candidate advice that helps them find the scale-ups and the startups, um, helps them rate them, just like you'd rate your Uber driver. You rate the person whose project you worked on at their company. Um, and isn't that right? Isn't that what we should do? Anyway, so we put that together with the help of a lot of young, young people. Um, what we also understood is that for millennials, they didn't really know how to make a great project for students at university to work on. They felt, what am I gonna do? What if I, what if I screw up? I don't know how to do that. Um, so where's Catherine? Is Catherine in this room somewhere? There you are. Um, so Catherine has been um, amazing at helping putting together a series of case studies in a s lots of different industries so that if you're a 25-year-old, you know, sort of person working in a small company and you want to give back to you, you know, you've got that project that you really want to do and it's going to help you lead your company, that will help you find the people to do that. Um, but we'll also give you plans and project plans so that you feel confident that you're going to be able to do that. It's kind of like being an outsourced learning and development for scale-up and start-up companies as they help their employees continue to learn in bite-sized chunks. Um, and then reporting the integration is also really important for the educators um, working with them so that they know that every single child gets work experience every single term. And we can help you see those that have had lots of it, so that's okay. And if someone isn't acting on all the recommendations that they're getting, you as the educator can find out about that and you can do something about it. So the flipping the classroom like Saul Khan did in the US has again is now here with us so that you can solve these problems. So those are two of the companies that I've been involved in. Raspberry Pi is a third and this one's obsessed with and focused on computing. Um, and has anybody used a Raspberry Pi? Here, everyone knows, okay. So for those of you who don't know what a Raspberry Pi is, it's a small computer, it costs about 35 pounds. Um, and 
we created it so that people everywhere would know to how to create computers rather than just using them. I'm just using this. I actually don't know how it's put together. And if you're just using an iPhone, you're using stuff that other people made, and that actually de-skills you. And at Raspberry Pi, they were very keen that everybody learnt about this. Um, so what they, one of the things they started with was clubs, after-school clubs, so that people could learn how to make projects with computers. Um, and that worked quite well. Um, they now have turned to educating educators because they found that the skills gap, um, the skills shortage of people who understand how to teach computers was so great that they really needed to upskill teachers throughout the UK. So they've created a number of online courses, which is really <coughs> interesting. Um, and again, um, courses and also magazines so that they can understand, and it's so it's okay. And they as an organization did this because nobody else was doing it. And they felt it needed to be done. And what they found, again, this started as a computer science department in Cambridge University because they were worried about the decrease of the pipeline of qualified students who were applying to them for computer science. And now, um, this is sort of seven or eight, not eight, nine years later, um, they are now seeing a huge upsurge in the quality of the applications that they're getting um, and also the quantity. And so are other university <coughs> computer, computer groups around because suddenly you want to make things because you've started at the age of six understanding that you can put stuff together and it's almost like Lego. It's a different type of, type of Lego and this is how it works with coding. So those have been three lovely, wonderful parts of my life for the last 10 years um, as an entrepreneur or as a whatever, you know, you know you know, former entrepreneur um, who's rediscovered being an entrepreneur, which is fun, this is good. Um, so I want to turn now to the role that universities have and what competitive advantage is all about. When I was at um, business school, I was very lucky to have a professor, Michael Porter, and he's the guy who wrote the, comp about the book about competitive advantage, which is how at a micro level you created a business that had competitive advantage above other businesses. He also wrote the competitive advantage of nations, about how one nation could, by creating an ecosystem where businesses flourished, surge ahead of other nations um, and create the optimum way for these, these companies to drive growth. So, um, and he was very helpful when writing the scale-up report. And what he came about was competitive advantage goes to nations who don't focus on starting companies, but who focus on scaling companies. And I'm going to put that further and say it doesn't go to communities that focus on starting companies. And actually, I'd even go say, or just big companies, but also those that are scaling, that are growing 20-30% per annum, year in, year out. Now I love this. So an academic study about the economic growth impact of universities. Um, so if you stick a university into a community, in, on, in general it will drive economic growth by about 0.4%. And that's without focusing on scale-ups. So um, what I'm really excited about, what I think is going to happen here, is if you focus this university on that, um, what will happen to your economic growth? So the provocation is regional economic growth doesn't come from universities that focus on startup, small or large companies, because those are static snapshots. We in business look at trends. So let's look at the growing ones. How do you like this picture? So <laughs> this picture is a great picture. It shows, along the bottom, the average growth per number of scale-ups per 100,000 of population over a three-year period. What you need to know is that it's good to be on the right-hand side of this line. Below is really bad. To the right, okay. Um, this plots all of the local enterprise partnerships, all of the communities in Britain, and um, I'm sad to say that right now you are here, but look at who else is over there, um, and also look at what, what you've done. The fact that you have half of your population that is now appropriately skilled means that there's no doubt that you will be going up here. And what I know that universities can do and communities can do when they focus on a particular issue is move this. I also know that you 
previously were over here. So we've been tracking you for about five years, um, and it's been very interesting watching you rip over to the, the right-hand side. And it, it works that you go this way and then you go up, upwards. So again, year by year, um, it it's kind of works that way. So what I'm excited about is in London, you've already passed London in the talent sweepstakes. You're, you're double what London is. So I'm very excited about working with you over the next year to drive your scale-up companies and also the influence that you will have on the economic growth of this area. And I know that you have everything that you need. Um, I know that you're not focused on yourself. Um, we know that. But it is worrying that some universities are. Um, and that you're going to work on people building human skills. So universities seeking growth, I think I would love to see you do something to service the scale-ups. So expand mid-career adult courses, soft skill training, stackable credentials. So what can you do of the 820 scale-ups that there are right now here in Newcastle? That's critical mass to supply some sort of executive ed to them and access to your fabulous students at the same time that they're dying to get their hands on and their projects for. I would love to sh ensure that every single one of your students got an internship or work experience with some of those. Not just the big ones. Um, and I'd love to think about your students' soft skills themselves and their leadership skills by getting them into the students in the surrounding schools. That will make a huge difference to those students. It will help place very rare assets who are practitioners into the schools to help the teachers, bearing in mind there's a shortage of 50,000 teachers in the secondary school system. Um, and every time you put one of your students into a school, they're leading and they're learning those soft schools, skills, not schools, skills. Um, and that, I have absolutely no doubt, will boost the economic growth and the impact that this university and this business school has in this area, um, which it absolutely needs, beyond a shadow of a doubt. Um, and I would also love, I asked you at the beginning of the lecture, how many big companies did you feature in your classrooms? I would love also for you to think about, as you invite role models in, that you make sure that for every small company or big company person, you also have somebody from a growing company. And because of these modern platforms, it's very easy to see exactly who these 820 scale-ups are. So there's no excuse to say, well, we don't know who they are, because they have to actually file taxes. Um, and you can get those very freely from the Scale-Up Institute, or from Founders for Schools, or from WorkFinder, or from many, many, many places. It used to be impossible, but it's not impossible any longer. So that is what I think about the future of work. I'm very excited about it. Some people don't feel filled with hope when they think about the future of work, but I think it fills me with hope and excitement um, about what we can do if we work together to um, take control of this opportunity that's in front of us rather than feel glum about there's really quite a lot to do. But anyway, I think as a leader, as a leader that's what we, we should do in our community. And that's all I have to say. But anyway, thank you.